The location was Lawrenceburg, Indiana. The year was 1999. A daughter succumbs to the same horrifying fate that her mother did 20 years earlier. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new, welcome. My name is Kimberlea. Let's get into the video for today. This story is a tragic one that has haunted me ever since I first heard it. And as you just heard, this is a mother and daughter who died the exact same way 20 years apart. There's actually gonna be two stories in one in this video, so I encourage you to listen all the way to the end so that you hear both of them. Like I said, this happened in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. It's a city on the Ohio River. It's just west of Cincinnati. And like we're told in many different true crime stories, residents said that this was a good town. It was full of really great middle-class people who were close-knit, they cared about one another and their community, and they did not expect anything like this to ever happen so close to home. The area surrounding the city is full of thick woods, and if you like hiking or being in the middle of nature, it could be a dream come true, but for a woman named Patricia De Christopher, it was a nightmare. 36-year-old Patricia De Christopher, I'm gonna to refer to her as Patty, had just moved to Lawrenceburg with her 12-year-old daughter, Amanda. They really could not afford much, but Patty did her best and had hopes that they would be in a better situation someday. But they lived in a studio apartment and they even slept in the same bed together. But somehow Patty always found a way to make it work like many single mothers, I was one of them. But the two of them were always moving. They never stayed put in one place because Patty really didn't feel like anywhere felt like home. This and many other struggles that she was going through had to do with what happened to Patty's mother when she was just a teenager. The trouble was that Patty could not get past her mother's gruesome murder. Patty spent a lot of time hiking in the woods because she said it made her feel connected to her mom. Patty's mother, Marie, used to take her hiking in the woods as a teen. And this is how they bonded together. Marie loved nature and thought the woods were so beautiful. She said that she felt grounded and in touch with herself and others, especially Patty. Marie said that her and Patty would always be connected and this actually becomes an eerie truth later on. As Patty and her daughter Amanda would spend time in the woods, it seemed as though they were reliving Patty's childhood. I almost found this to be a little odd at first because it was almost as though Patty was pretending she was her mother. But then I realized that Patty probably used this as a way to escape her reality, to take her back to a time before her grief really took a hold of her and changed her. Because people around Patty said that it seemed like when Marie died, a part of Patty died with her and it affected all aspects of her life. It was even the reason why Patty and her husband Patrick had separated. Patty and her husband Patrick, and it was cute that they pretty much had the same name, they actually met through a dating site and after about six months of struggling to get Patty to open up to him, she finally told him what happened and how her mother died. At that point is when they really started to grow closer. They got married, they had Amanda, but unfortunately Patty's pain, it just always stood in the way of their relationship. And even though they were separated, Patrick actually followed Patty and his daughter to Lawrenceburg. He wanted to be close to them and he even had hopes that someday they could be together again as a family. Patrick would always try to encourage Patty to live her life to the fullest, to embrace the fact that she's alive and to try to be happy, especially for their daughter Amanda and that Patty's mom would have wanted it this way. She would want her to be happy. Now I think it's important to let you in on what happened to Patty's mother Marie because this will help you understand why it's so horrifying and hard for Patty to put into words. Patty's mom Marie was also a single mother and she had recently gotten divorced. She was finally back in the dating pool when she met a guy named Dennis Mitchell. They went on a date together. He takes her hunting in the woods, but while they were there hunting, Dennis got an idea and it was a sinister one. A few days later on December 1st, 1979 in Nickelville, New York, which by the way, was in a county called Lawrence, 
which I don't know about you, but I found to be very creepy since Patty was now living in a town called Lawrenceburg, but it was in Indiana. Nevertheless, she met Dennis at a bar called the Riverside Tavern in St. Regis Falls in Nickelville, New York. By 10 p.m., patrons saw them leaving together. They were leaving in Dennis's friend's car, and it turns out he told Marie he wanted to take her somewhere special to go stargazing. I guess this sounded romantic. She liked nature and she loved the woods, so she actually agreed. She hardly knew him, pretty much their second date, and she agreed. So Dennis drives her to a remote and desolate area of thick woods and Dennis promises to her that it's going to be the best place to do some gazing up at the stars. I'm thinking Marie must have gotten a somewhat uneasy feeling because she asked Dennis how he could possibly know where he was going in these isolated woods but he insisted he did and he kept walking deeper and deeper and Marie followed behind him. The stargazing promise was partially true. They looked up over the treetops and the sky was so clear. You could really see all of the stars twinkling. So that's the point where they actually stopped and they were admiring the sky. But that's also when the unexpected happened because to Marie's surprise, Dennis, a man she had just recently started dating, began to touch her. She didn't wanna go there yet. She liked him, but she was not ready for that. So she told him, you know, I'm having a good time, but I want to take it slow. Dennis was not having this. He wasn't happy about it. He wanted to be the one controlling the speed at which their relationship was going to progress. At this point, they get into an argument. He's being very aggressive. He told her, this is what he's deciding. He threw Marie on the ground. She starts to get really scared and she knew no one would hear her if she screamed. She's in the middle of nowhere. She's only five foot two and I'm only four foot 11. So I can only imagine the feeling of helplessness against a man holding me down and attacking me. Marie pleaded with him to stop, but he started to take off her clothes. He went ahead and did what he wanted. There was no way Marie could stop him. Not only was he forcing himself on her, but he was hurting her while doing it. He was purposely being very forceful. He was pushing her into the ground really hard. You can only imagine what he was doing to her body and he didn't care about her well-being whatsoever. It wasn't a romantic date at this point. She was fighting for her life. But afterwards somehow, maybe when he was dressing, she managed to escape, but the only place for her to go was back to his car. She was screaming for her life. No one could hear her. She reaches his car. She gets inside. And for whatever reason, the keys are in the ignition. I don't know why, but before she can actually start the car, he catches up to her. I keep thinking, why didn't she lock the door right away? But I know the adrenaline gets to you. And I know a lot of times you can't even think straight. You're like paralyzed with fear, but he gets into the car, pulls her out of the vehicle. And this is just when the tragic things happen to her. In his rage, for whatever reason, this man, Marie, 15 times. I mean, he must have known that he was going to do this all along, unless men just carry knives around. I know he was a hunter, but either way, I think you can see why Marie's death haunted Patty so much, and it would make it very, very hard for her to trust anyone. This man, after doing this to her, actually goes back to the bar that they were at to drop off his friend's car. He comes inside and he's covered in blood. He came in literally screaming and crying that he had just killed a woman. So maybe he wasn't planning to do this, but his friends and the bar patrons, they helped clean him up, but they couldn't console him. They called the police and he was arrested. This man, he had the audacity to claim that this was self-defense. Excuse me, sir, what? How? But apparently he told the police, quote, she tried to roll me and I took out a knife and started her. What does that even mean? She tried to roll me. If you know, leave it in the comments. I have no idea what that means and I didn't even bother to look it up. 
Later, he changes the story and he claims that another unknown man that he can't describe, he doesn't remember what he looked like, did this. But he didn't want to tell on him at the time because he was scared that the man would hurt his wife and his child. He was married. Wow. Sick. For reasons that I do not know, a court found him guilty of not first degree murder, but second degree murder. He was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. How brutal and senseless. Patty would constantly replay what she thought her mother must have gone through in her head and what she was going through in her very last moments, looking up at the stars and being to death. So this is one of the reasons she struggled through her life. She was left with no one. Now I want to jump back to the present because I told you we're going to be talking about two different stories here. So now let's get into the day that Patty died. It was a normal day on April 5th, 1999. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary at all. It was Patty's 36th birthday and Patrick bought her some things for her birthday and suggested they all hang out together as a family. But that night, Patty already had plans, so she declined. She said she was going to head over to the Argosy Riverboat Casino, which I thought was interesting. There's a picture of it here and then go to a bar with a friend. Patrick decided to take Amanda for the next few days so that she could enjoy her birthday. They said goodbye to Patty. They wished her a happy birthday and they hoped she had a good night. When she made what I think is a chilling comment, she said to Patrick and I quote, I know you gave me a better life and I really appreciate that. And I really and truly do love you. This is something that I'd like you to remember because I have some thoughts, some a theory, if you will, that I'd like to express later on. So keep that in mind. On the night of Patty's birthday, she goes out with a friend to a local bar. It's called Hilljacks. It's not there anymore. I tried to look it up. The building looks like it's still there. So I'm showing it to you right here. Most likely they rebuilt it or possibly it's the same building, but it's renamed and I found it on Google Maps. The two women are having fun. They're drinking together. They're enjoying their night. And then two guys walk up. Their names are Ronnie and George. They introduce themselves and they ask if they can buy the women a drink. Nothing out of the ordinary there. Pretty typical, nothing wrong with that. And since it's Patty's birthday, the friend lets them know and they want to celebrate. Ronnie and George were both in their 30s. They were both divorced and now they were roommates. Ronnie was more of a leader and he carried himself like a tough guy and George was more subdued. He seemed to look up to Ronnie and follow his lead. And Ronnie was a smooth talker. He was very forward and blunt and he sort of expected people to do what he wanted. Ronnie starts flirting with Patty and they were drinking a lot. They were doing a lot of shots and of course the guys kept buying them drinks and it wasn't long before Patty was very intoxicated and it was getting late. Her friend suggested that they call it a night because she had to work the next day. But of course, like many people that are celebrating their birthday and they're on a roll drinking, Patty didn't want to leave. She kept insisting, just have one more drink, have one more drink. That's a typical thing we say, just have one more drink. Patty couldn't convince her friend to stay, but the friend tells Patty to promise her she will not leave this bar to go anywhere else and that she'll have one more drink and go home alone because basically her friend did not want her going home with these random guys. Now you may disagree and that's okay. We can agree to disagree, but one cardinal rule in my book about friendship, it's girl code. You never leave your friend behind. I don't care if you're late for work or you're going to be hungover. I, whatever it takes, I grab my friend. I'll, I'll drag her out of the bar if I have to, but I would never leave her. Never. And it got me thinking this woman is scarred from her mother's death yet. She's putting herself in what could be harm's way with strangers in the same situation that her mom was in. Sort of. Ronnie is encouraging her to drink more and more alcohol. And personally, I think they may have put something in her drink because of what happens later. But these guys kept trying to convince Patty to leave with them. And disgustingly, they made a similar promise to her 
that Dennis made to her mom on the night she was murdered. They said, we have a really cool place to show you for your birthday. It was at this point, and please do not come for me. This is just a thought that I had. I kept thinking, is she trying to live out a self-fulfilling prophecy or does she have a death wish to be with her mother? Because I just feel like I would be so traumatized. I would not put myself in this position. Or were they somehow so connected that they just met the same fate? And it bothered me when I heard the story because also recall the statement that she made to Patrick earlier that day. It just seems so chilling to me. Like, did she know this was gonna happen? Because also at this point, she had a chance to set herself on a different path that would have saved her. She tells the guys that she's tired and she says she's gonna go home. At this point, she even tells the bartender to call her husband. She gives the bartender her husband Patrick's phone number so she could get a ride home, but unfortunately he never answers. It was late and Patrick and their daughter watched some scary movies and then they just went to bed. But the bartender did leave a message on their answering machine and that must have been really scary and sad to listen to later on knowing had he answered, he probably wouldn't have to be facing what happened. The bartender did ask if he could call someone else for her, but she didn't know anyone else's number. Maybe, maybe she didn't know her friend's number by heart. And then somehow the bartender lets Patty leave with these men, even though he knows that she's super intoxicated, but I, I guess you can't truly expect the bartender to be perfect or know who these guys are, whether they were friends of hers, but sometimes they really do a great job keeping tabs on their customers, I will say that. But they drive back to their apartment. She has no idea where she is. She's completely out of it, almost blackout drunk. And this is so gross, I cannot stand this part. But these men get out a freaking disposable camera and if anyone is much younger than I am, it's not exactly like a Polaroid camera because you know the pictures don't come out automatically. These cameras were actually, these little plastic cameras, they had film inside of them. And then you use them all up, it would tell you how many pictures are left. And then you have to actually go to a photo center and have them developed. So they start to completely take advantage of Patty, putting her in all of these nasty, positions and obviously they did things to her too both of them why would you do this it makes me so angry it makes me sick and after all of that they put her in their car and they start to drive her far into the woods oh my god i was shocked this is exactly what happened to her mother how could this even happen how could this even be real you'd probably have a better chance getting hit by lightning they just drove deeper and deeper into the woods to carry out their plan. Still taking pictures. Cause this is how we end up finding out how everything played out that night. George is driving and Ronnie is demanding him to keep going. And George just follows along until Ronnie tells him to stop. When they stop, they drag her down a deserted road in Switzerland County next to a creek. It probably looks something like this. I found these recent pictures of the area and here's some similar areas in the same vicinity. And you can see just how wooded the area really is. Probably even more so back in 1999. That has to be terrifying. No one can hear you scream. You don't know where you are. There's nowhere to go. A lot of time had passed since they left the bar. This is another reason I feel like they gave Patty some kind of drug because she was able to semi walk with the help of one of the men, and she was able to talk to them. But she was still completely, completely out of it, especially from what the picture showed. And apparently, according to the reports, Patty did get to see the stars that night, and she was admiring them. And she told the guys that they were right about how cool that place really was. It's totally sickening to me. But they actually took her out there, according to George, because Ronnie had a plan to take her out there and make sure that she never told anyone what happened that night and what they did to her. I don't know if George knew exactly what was gonna happen because he was actually surprised when Ronnie began to strangle Patty. 
At some point, she appears to be dead. She stops moving, and George is yelling, yelling at Ronnie to stop, asking, why is he doing this? And that must be a terrifying position to be in because you don't know what this man is capable of doing to you. Then now, Patty's lying there. She's not moving, and Ronnie thinks she's dead. So the men start to walk away. They start to leave, and okay, I want to stop right here because I have something to say. Because I've watched and read a lot of stories of women surviving these situations. All of them, without fail, pretend to be dead until their assailant actually leaves, until they cannot hear them any longer. They wait and wait until they can't hear anything. And then they get up. It saves lives. So what I would say is hold your breath, stay still, let out a tiny bit of air at a time, take in tiny, tiny breaths. And if, and if your assailant comes close to you, do whatever you can. Your life depends on you being as still as possible. A lot of times your assailant is dealing with their adrenaline, they're in shock, and they're not gonna notice the little things. So if you can remain completely still, that might save your life. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, Patty got up while the men were still there. I do not know why. Maybe, like I said, in those moments, you can't think straight and you just, it's, it's the fight or flight response and you just run. But she runs and of course she's weak, she's not fast enough and Ronnie catches up to her. But it turns out that Ronnie wanted a victim. He was abusive in his past and he had almost been waiting for his chance to let out all of his rage and he ends up stabbing her again and again. He even slit her almost to the point of complete decay. And to think a stranger did this to you. And I keep thinking, do these men set out to do the same thing to her? Did they know her from the town? Did they hear people gossiping and telling about what happened to Patty's mom? Was it planned? I just can't imagine this being completely random. And I keep thinking about that. How? Three days go by without a word from Patty and her husband actually does get pretty worried. But he had their daughter and he figured, you know, it really wasn't his business. Maybe she was, you know, gone for her birthday. She's with someone. She's hanging out. She's an adult. But when she doesn't show up for work, that's when he starts getting the sickening feeling that something is wrong. At this point, he drives around. He looks for her at all the places that he knows she could possibly be. And then he even asks his daughter, has your mom said anything? Have you heard from her since her birthday? And Amanda says no. A woman that's walking in the woods to her terror, she sees a body. This always seems to happen and I'm like, okay, it's a desolate area when they describe the murder, but then someone's randomly walking there later and stumbles upon a body. How does that happen? But yes, it happened. A woman finds Patty's body. She has no ID. She only has a boarding pass for that casino boat that she went to and it's in her jeans pocket and that's all they have. But at the same time, Patty's husband, Patrick, is at the police station looking for Patty. So they end up putting two and two together and they realized after showing him pictures that it was indeed Patty. So here's another really astonishing and creepy thing that happens when Patty's husband tells their daughter, Amanda, that they found her mother. She turns to him and said, she's dead, right? It has to be intuition. I knew my grandfather was dead before I was told. I know that people aren't gonna believe that's true, but maybe you've had a similar experience where your gut just told you something like that. In Patty's case, no one could believe the similarities between her death and her mother Marie's death. Once they started interviewing Patty's friends, they end up at the bar and they asked patrons and bartenders if anyone saw anything and it turns out people were able to describe George and Ronnie. They tracked down George and Ronnie, they searched their entire apartment and they found the disposable camera. They really didn't need anything else because those pictures were proof. They even took pictures of Patty in the woods right before her murder, but they also found blood on Ronnie's jacket that he was seen wearing that night. George ends up getting 30 years in prison for testifying against Ronnie, so he had a reduced sentence. And because he was such a follower of what Ronnie says, I kind of do believe that maybe he wasn't the ringleader, but Ronnie is sentenced to 65 years in prison. Just a side note, it looks like Marie, Patty's mother's killer, 
actually got out of prison in 2019. So that's all I have for this tragic story of this beautiful mother and daughter who died the same exact way. All right, thank you so much for watching. I will see you in one of my next videos. Bye.